Hello everyone. And let me just load this iPad up. Thanks to Pastor Chris for stitching us up with this one. It wasn't the intention at all that we'd rock in and end up being on the communion talk. He asked me to do the second meeting talk this afternoon. I said, okay, I think I could just about manage that. And then somehow the negotiation ended with me and Mitch both ending up here this afternoon as well. So if you've got a deal to be done, don't go and negotiate with Pastor Chris because you will lose. Um, okay, for, the, for a, uh, a title for my talk, um, we'll look at um, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We'll go there first. Um, yeah, title for my talk, um, A Salty Bunch of Amateurs, which hopefully will make some sense later on. This is kind of a, a mix of a couple of talks and a few things that have been rolling around my head recently, so hopefully I'll um, make sense of it and you can get something out of it. Um, <clears throat> A couple of months ago, I found this article, it was in The Economist, and I'm not pretending to be smart or anything, it just pops up on my phone and I clicked on it. Um, and they were, they were talking, I think they'd, um, a, a psychologist has just brought out a new book about how terrible the next kind of generation are and how doomed they are because of all the social media and all of the horrible stuff that's going on in the world. And um, the guys in the article looked back on what psychologists have been saying for the last hundred years. So in the 1930s, um, psychologists wrote about young people at the time. Um, I think it's an article from America, so it was more about Americans. Um, but they described them as rotting before their eyes, apathy and disenchantment were taking hold, and they blamed um, unemployment and marijuana. Um, but that generation then went and fought and won World War II. Then in the 1980s, the next set of psychologists, probably the guys that were described as um, rotting before their eyes, um, they wrote about the young people then and said um, young people are growing up too quickly and they blamed TV for the, for the problems. Now young people are in a mess for a whole heap of other reasons, as I say, and there are, like some, there are some tough stats um, that you can read about mental health and that sort of thing. Um, but social media and smartphones and the style of parenting, they're all to blame now. Um, and what I want to kind of hopefully have a look at is um, that kind of new school and old school way of thinking. It happens in our lives. Um, we're a church of quite a few generations in here. Um, so hopefully, yeah, we can get something out of this. Let's look in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We know this very, very well. Um, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, and this is the bit that I want to kind of highlight, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So we've had 100 years of psychologists saying that this next generation is um, doomed, um, but on the day of Pentecost, there was an untoward generation then. And I suppose what I think it highlights is that that will always be a natural way of looking at things, the chaotic generation, which is the next one. Um, as we grow a bit older, I think we realize that um, anything new you just get a bit scared of. Um, let's go across to Isaiah chapter 1. And I often think to myself, so I, I was brought up in the Lord. I often think to myself, would it have been easier to grow up in the Lord 30 or 40 years ago when this generation wasn't so doomed? Um, and I don't know the actual answer to that, and I'll never find out. Um, but there's a natural tendency... Um, as you grow older, grow older to think that everything in the past was better. The good old days is a phrase that we hear a lot um, and that we should be scared and fearful for whatever the future, this new thing that comes forward is. But we know that there's nothing new under the sun. And as I say there, um, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the main, um, well, Peter says um, in, in many other words, but he says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So it's existed then, it will exist now. And that's something that we're just going to have to deal with in our lives and hopefully make the most of. Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, in verse, 50, uh, verse 16. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings before mine eyes cease to do evil. Learn, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. Though they be red uh, like crimson, they shall be as wool. Um, and it's this come let us reason together part which is really important for us. Um, as I say, there's this kind of new school and old school way of thinking. And I think the reason that this is prompt, like it's been, been in my thoughts recently is at work, I work in an office and before COVID happened, we were in five days a week. I work in London, it takes me an hour and 20 minutes for something to get there. And by the end of the week, we're pretty tired. Um, but that was just 
work life. Then COVID happened and we figured out this working from home thing and absolutely loved it. Um, and then we, COVID kind of drops off and then the managing directors want you in the office all the time again. And um, they think when we're at home, or that's a massive generalization, my MD thought that when we're at home, you're basically doing no work. Um, and we had to meet in the middle and the, the, the outcome was that he's just from an old school way of thinking, he couldn't get his head around how you could work efficiently at home without your colleagues there. Um, doesn't understand Teams and Zoom, all of this stuff. Um, and um, yeah, what, uh, an, another thing that's kind of prompted this trail of thought, I suppose, is um, we had a kids camp a couple of years ago and um, we were talking about what is relevant to the kids nowadays at school, what they go through, which is very different to what I went through and maybe different from what the generation before me went through. Um, and our natural tendency, again, is to, is to really fear for it. It's like, how on earth can the kids deal with some of the things that happen um, nowadays? Like, it's, it's a genuine concern, specifically for parents, but just for adults in general. I think we can often look at it that way because it's different to how we had it. Um, and their attitude was awesome towards it. They, they were a real inspiration to us, and the, the, the learning was definitely from the kids up to the adults in that session, where they just get on with their life. It's just part of their day-to-day. They know what's right and wrong, and um, they, they, they'll have to deal with it in their work life. I'm sure plenty of people have had to deal with the pronouns at the bottom of emails and that sort of thing, and trying to figure all of that out. And that's coming into the kids' school life, and you think, ah, oh, how are they gonna cope with that? But they cope brilliantly because it's their generation. They can, they can cope with that sort of thing, and God clearly blesses them, and the word of God doesn't change. Let's have a quick look at, uh, we'll go to Proverbs chapter 20. In verse 29, the glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. Um, we can read also, in I won't look at anyone whilst I'm reading that one. Uh, chapter 16, we'll read that as well quickly, verse 31 and 32. The hoary head is the crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. So it's not the new school way of thinking is perfect or the old school way of thinking is perfect, but rather the variety that we have in our fellowship and kind of the way we collaborate and talk to each other and use each other's experiences like we did at that kids camp where they could teach us plenty of things. Um, we, we come and reason together. And if we, I suppose our job in the church is to create the environment for that to be able to happen um, and for both sides to be listening. Um, and I think ultimately that allows us to be knit together. I'll just quote Colossians chapter 2, bear with me, to save you jumping around all the time. Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 19. And not holding the head from which all the body um, by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. If we're able to, as I say, not think, all right, old school is the only way or new school is the only way, but we meet each other in the middle, we reason together using the measure of God as, as, our, as our guide, that's, that's what we'll um, achieve. We'll achieve that knitted together, and the outcome of that is increasing with the increase of God, which is what we're all after. Um, let's jump across to Matthew chapter 5. This is the salt bit of the title of the talk. Hopefully this makes some sense. As I say, I'm kind of mixing a couple of talks together, so hopefully it moulds enough. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, we know this well. <clears throat> Let's just look over there. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, uh, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. Um, so we're the salt of the earth, and um, salt preserves. That's one of the main characteristics of salt, and it also draws out flavour. Um, and our duty as Christians in this church um, as Jesus has commanded us to do, um, is to save people, but it's also to bring them home. 
So um, Pastor Jeremy gave a talk on this at winter camp a couple of years ago back home. Um, and he spoke about, I think he quoted a hymn, um, and part of our duty is, is twofold. We have to bring them in and we bring them home. And that's why the old and young, uh, the new school, the old school, however you want to phrase it, need to be knitted together because um, that's, how, that's how we'll bring each other home. Um, but the, the salt can do that. The, the salt preserves. And I think, the, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking the only way that the salt is effective is by contact. Um, but that's not actually true. I suppose you have those like salt. If you go to a fancy steak restaurant, you might see the Himalayan salt chambers in the back where they're aging all of their meat and that sort of thing. Um, and that kind of slows down the rotting process and enhances the flavor a bit. But really, when they put the salt on the meat and, and grill it then, um, that's when it really brings out the flavor. Um, and that's what we want. And it's multiple co- points of contact. And we heard it in the gifts where our walk is a day-by-day, step-by-step walk. Um, <clears throat> And we want to be a good influence on those near us, the people that we come across, um, to preserve them and impact their life and to ultimately fulfill our duty that that God's given us. Um, And the way we do that is by contact. Um, Yeah, at work, my my job is an insurance underwriter and to stop Tony falling asleep, I won't talk about it too much, but um, the... Part of my job is a kind of commercial side where we have to develop business and we want, we're a competitive business so we want people to come back to us as much as we can um, to make my old school director lots of money so he can go on his big holidays. Um, but um, yeah, so part of that is business development and we found we, we had to go through a bit of a process to like, improve ourselves basically and we found that instead of just doing one big party for our, our clients or one big lunch where you take them to the Himalayan salt chamber for the steak, that sort of thing, more effective than that was the multiple small points of contact that we'd have with them throughout the year. Um, so every piece of business that came in, we'd be in good contact with them. And that works so much more effectively and is much more achievable for the employee when it's, it's small and effective. I think that's something that we can really bring into our lives as well. Um, I don't know about you, this is one of my personal big flaws. Um, but when I go to camps or a, a big meeting or something like that and you know, you get really built up and inspired. I go home with these completely unachievable targets. So I'm going to wake up 5 a.m. 5 a. tomorrow. I have a good hour of prayer. I'm going to make an amazing breakfast, sort my lunches out for the week, do all of this sort of stuff, read a book, save the world, that, that type of thing. <laughs> um, and then two, three days later, it turns into a massive negative. So I've been built right up, try and do something completely unachievable for a couple of days and then it actually turns into a negative because I haven't achieved what I set out to do after that camp. Um, So as part of my personal development, (laughs) I suppose, that's something that I've I've got to work on. Um, And at work, a lot of people would have heard of SMART targets, the acronym, and the A in that is achievable. Um, And exactly as it said in the gift, it's the step-by-step, day-by-day. So if I do that big up and down, sometimes it ends up more negative than it started. But if I just do a little bit more each day, or a little bit better each day, or a bit more fervent each day, then I'll really find that um, the, the efficiency and um, that to be effective. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. And it's the, the little and often contacts with our, with our God that then feeds our conscience. So it really builds into us where we don't, we don't want to be worn out by the things of the Lord. We, we don't want anything to feel too big for us. Um, and we have to really strike a balance in our lives, which is why it's good to have effective prayer where we can. Um, but they shouldn't be burdensome. And I think as we, those little points of contact each time, just like the salt and how it preserves things, that will preserve our relationship with God and and really build us up so that we're at a point where um, we have a habit of prayerfulness. So the next thing that comes our way, we're in that habit of prayerfulness and it doesn't seem too big to then kind of jump up to that level. Uh, Isaiah chapter 55, bear with me, I'll just jump there too. I'm going to read from verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. 
And as we heard in the two testimonies today, and if you're new here, if you speak to any m member of the Revival Fellowship, you'll find um, that the experience that we've had where we've been filled with the Holy Spirit allows this verse to be 24-7, 365 days a year. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And because um, we're filled with that Holy Spirit, that is an instant access to God whenever we need him, whenever we need to call on him. Um, and that, is, that allows us to have those multiple points of contact. Uh, let's jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. verse 12 for our rejoicing is this the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom but by the grace of God we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you would and it's, it's more the uh, the testimony of our conscience part that I want to pick up on and as I say if we develop this habit of prayerfulness and these multiple small points of contact um, the testimony of our conscience will be visible to us, so we'll be guided by that in our day-to-day -day life, but it'll, it'll also be visible to the, to the people around us. And that's where we can be the salt that um, preserves people in, in the sense of saving them and um, bringing them in um, to then bring them home. Uh, let's jump to Colossians chapter 3. Nearly there. I won't be too much longer. Very simple, but good scripture. I suppose this is where the, the amateur part comes into it. So we want to be a bunch of salty amateurs, and hopefully that makes some sense in a moment. Um, verse 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Um, and there's a thing which is um, very common in most walks of life, which is called imposter syndrome, where... You're, you're put in a role or you're asked to do a job where you don't think you're qualified for it. Um, and especially in a fellowship where, there's, as we were saying, there's multiple generations, there's a lot of those grey wise heads in the room. And again, I won't look at anyone in particular. Um, but there's, there's lots of experience and wisdom and sometimes we can think, and I've certainly experienced this for myself, um, is that they, they should kind of do all the, all the hard work. They should be the ones up the front doing all the preaching and um, all, all of the difficult things. Um, but if we do whatever we do, so that might be up here or it might be in fellowship time, it might be during the week um, in follow-ups, that sort of thing. If we do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, um, then we will uh, receive, as it says in the next verse, the, the reward of the inheritance because we serve Christ. Um, so the, we, we don't have to worry about that imposter syndrome albeit that's natural and if you feel that don't worry about it but to to step out in faith and to do it unto god and not unto man um and I, I think i think we'll see good stuff from that um but the, the word amateur i only found this out fairly recently you probably all know this anyway um but in a in a modern day context i think um it's kind of used as a fairly negative word um it describes a lesser skill or um someone that's unskillful or inept um, but the origin of the word is actually from French and Latin, uh, which is to love, amor. Um, so you do it for the love of it. So I think we should be, as much as we can, and we have good structure to our meetings, and we can be, uh, we take um, God very seriously, so we, we want to give it our all. Um, but we want to do it for the love of it. We want to be here, not because it's just a Sunday and that's what we do on a Sunday, but we want to be here because we're going to be uplifted by what we hear and we're going to be able to, um, where two or three are gathered, there God is in the midst of us. So we can learn something. We might be able to give something. Um, but if we do it for the love of it, um, we'll really reap the rewards. Let's look at Acts chapter 6 to finish up. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. <clears throat> and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring, murmuring uh, of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. 
Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out uh, among you uh, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over the business. So there's an issue. It's, it's cropped up between the Grecians and uh, part of the assembly there, it turns out to be the widows, were neglected in the daily ministration, so they weren't getting the ministry that they needed. And it's interesting that the qualification required of the seven people to sort this out um, is pretty simple, really, and something which is achievable and attainable for us. Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, uh, which is a gift of the Holy Ghost, who we may appoint over this business. The outcome of that is verse 7, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples uh, multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And it carries on. Um, so it's not the cleverest or the person with the most gray hair. It doesn't say how old these people were. It doesn't say whether they're an old school way of thinking or a new school way of thinking. These were seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost. So that applies to all of us. So when there's a, an opportunity for us to step up or step in um, to, to help serve, um, we're qualified if we, if we can meet that just as it was required um, all that time ago. So, um, and if we do it as amateurs, i.e. we do it for the love of it, um, we'll, we'll really reap the reward of that. So we can be a bunch of salty amateurs. I'll leave it there. We'll have a prayer line now. So if you've got anything you want to pray for, um, there'll be some brothers up the front. Don't hold back.